the um, I'm a director on the inclusive growth team um, at Palladium. Um, I've also been the activity manager, the activity lead um, for the Catalyze Market Systems for Growth activity in Ethiopia until recently, um, and um, also a PSE trainer. Uh, so this topic is close to my heart. Um, today we're going to be looking at um, ways that we can structure solicitations and co-creation processes to both enhance the user experience of our applicants, but more importantly, to shape and inform more inclusive and sustainable business models. Uh, we hope to share some insights from our co-creation journey uh, from, some, from two recent PSE-oriented annual program statements, or APSs, as we've worked, worked to take a more transactional, uh, a less transactional and more transformational role to our requests for applications and our structuring of awards. Um, we'll provide an overview of our co-creation approach and how different sector contexts have influenced our co-creation in, the, in, a, in, a, in these recent concept calls, uh, specifically focusing on the water, uh, sanitation and hygiene sectors and the fertilizer sector. Um, we're then going to jump into some examples of, of how we've, we've approached co-creation in each. Um, if you have any questions or contributions, please include them in the chat. Uh, we will take moments to pause um, from, from time to time, and my colleagues will share them with me as, as we have time. Um, and again, at the end, we'll also have some time for, for questions and answers. Um, but first, I would like to ask my panelists to very quickly introduce themselves um, and the role that they have on the Catalyze Market Systems for Growth activity. Over to you, Elizabeth Adams, first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Adams. I am uh, the current um, MS4G Activity Director at Palladium, um, and I'll hand it over to Sahul to introduce himself. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Sahul Trusso. I am the Deputy Country Director for Catalyze USA MS4G Activity based of uh, Ethiopia. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> So, first of all, I just want to very quickly um, introduce the Catalyze program. Um, for some of you who may be, uh, may be aware, uh, the Catalyze program is an eight year uh, contract um, whose primary purpose is to mobilize private capital um, throughout the world. Um, it is a buy in driven mechanism, um, which means that um, we have programs all over the world covering multiple different sectors. Um, targeting different types of customer segments, small and medium sized enterprises, um, and we use a variety of different means to um, engage the private sector, um, both through a, a combination of pay for results subcontracts, um, as well as grants under contract. Um, the Ethiopia Market Systems for Growth Program, otherwise um, re referred to as MS4G, um, is one of those activities. Um, it is a, it is currently a, um, a $59 million program that is focusing on multiple sectors, um, primary, but, but focus very much on wash, food security and, and fertilizer. Um, and we do, we cover a variety of, um, kind of intervention areas, including enterprise support, um, youth empowerment, um, capital mobilization, digital transformation, policy reforms and others. Okay. Um, sorry, and just, just one thing here on our activities as a large uh, program and a global program covering multiple sectors who, you know, our mandate under Catalyze is to engage the local private sector in a variety of different ways. And through that, we've been able to iterate um, a variety, you know, iterate various different ways of soliciting and co-creating um, activities with uh, our, our local partners. Okay. So let's just jump in here. So um, for those of you who have, and I do see a number of you that I know on here and here in the, that have joined, um, for those of us who have been working in the PSC in the private sector engagement space, you know, within USAID, we've observed an increasing amount of grants under contract funds, or what we often will call GUC funds, being oriented towards engaged in the private sector. Right. And in my view, you know, GUC funds are a very powerful means to activate and embed private sector engagement with USAID programs. If 
across most, if not all, sectors in which USAID works in, right? And I've really appreciated the shift. In the past, GUCs are very much organ, you know, oriented towards NGOs, local organizations, and now GUC funds are really having a much more diverse um, focus, all right? In Ethiopia, we have a $25 million partnerships and innovation facility that involves both that where we look at both uh, pay for results subcontracts to mobilize capital, train youth, train women to, for employment, um, as well as other outcomes. It also involves a 19 million grant under contract fund that specifically targets local partners. Um, last year, we released a $3 million um, dollar annual program statement, or APS, um, that focused on private sector-led initiatives in WASH, food security, and fertilizer. Just as another comment, and we're not really talking about it, but a lot of the themes are, uh, we're not talking about it today, but the themes are relevant, um, is that we've recently completed a $1 million uh, open innovation competition focusing on innovative concepts in the, in the um, fertilizer sector, in which we worked with an amazing local partner, Ice Addis, to support us in the process. It might be something that we, that we talk about in a future um, learning session, because for us, it's a in really interesting means of how to um, work with and through um, our local uh, innovation ecosystem. All right, so through the APS, we've targeted partners with concepts across an array of solution areas, as you can see in the slide here. For partnerships that involve significant cost share or investment on the part of our, of our applicants and grantees. Now, <clears throat> as we're focusing on these, you know, addressing, you know, achieving some of these outcomes, be it testing or scaling activity, you know, uh, innovations, addressing gaps in, in local market systems. <clears throat> we're not, we're, we are, we see, while we're focusing on the direct outcomes that our generators, that we can work with our partners to generate, we see our, our portfolio of, of grant under contract funded initiatives to produce Im impact beyond the direct um, Im results of that specific activity. For example, really do try to capture lessons learned and best practices in, on ways to adapt and mobilize business models um, and initiatives to tackle development challenges, right? And then share some of those, some of those, those best practices to the wider um, development community and the private sector um, in Ethiopia. <clears throat> We're also working to promote and encourage behavior change and more sustainable, uh, sustainable, inclusive business practices across our private sector partners in the sectors in which we work and the service, the services sectors um, that support the, the growth of those sectors. <clears throat> and we're also looking to build the capacity of local private of the local private sector to test and scale inclusive and sustainable business models without fully relying on donor or uh, donor funds. Okay. Now, as we've structured our annual program statement, um, we've, we've tried to model it um, to the to USAID's um, co you know, current um, mechanisms or windows for engaging the private sector. <clears throat> In the past, we structured it around um, the Global Development Alliance annual program statement. Um, and now we, we're, we're looking to align our approaches to um, the new Private Sector Collaboration Pathway, APS, um, where we see co-creation <clears throat> being at the heart of the entire process, right, where we're, not a, we're able to explore a series of ideas, but work with our partners to find an outcome um, that is um, both impactful and sustainable. All right. So as I've noticed, noted above, our, our GUC funds are almost entirely oriented towards the local private sector in Ethiopia, um, including new local private sector partners that are yet to apply to an APS such as ours, or even receive funding from USAID or another implementing partner. Um, in this regard, we've learned that achieving the desired outcomes and impacts of private sector and of PSE oriented initiatives funded through these grants often starts with a thoughtful approach to soliciting co-creating concepts and structuring awards. As we're designing a new APS, um, and this is in, in, in Ethiopia and Catalyze and any other program um, that we might be managing, um, we want to be thinking through how can we design solicitations 
to attract a diverse private, uh, a diverse set of private sector applicants and receive concepts to optimize additionality, sustainability, and impact, right? We also want to be looking at how can we make the process of working with USAID or working with us as an implementing partner, both appealing to and accessible for new local private sector partners. And then finally, we think through how can we structure the co-creation process to, to, to reduce the time and effort um, for all parties to move from concept um, towards award implementation, right? Under MS4G, we've, we've aimed to structure the application process to enhance the partner experience and the overall efficiency of the process from RFA to award. Um, in particular, we have focused on streamlining the application process up front so that an applicant does not need to invest a significant amount of time unless their concept is actually under serious consideration by our team. Thus, we've structured, structured the, the solicitation in a manner um, that the concepts are, are able, we just get a, an idea of what that initial concept might be, um, and then wait for some of the details to happen after we've decided to move forward. All right. Also, to the extent possible, we, we work to avoid a passive approach where we release an RFA and wait to see who applies. And that's where increasingly we've really started to use road shows outside of Addis Ababa to make sure so to market the APS and make sure that we are getting applicants from outside of the, the capital city. Um, and I think one other thing that's, that's key, and this is something that is, is, is coming, from, that's coming from the direction of USAID, or the, or the leadership of, of the USA private sector engagement hub is that we have mo removed the more traditional requirement where an, I, an implementing partner requests a full application at the end of the, the co-creation process. Rather, we co-create together to structure the ward where the, the full application is only is an option on a case-by-case -case basis, right? And while this does add work to our team, we feel as though it reduces the burden on the partner and results in a better outcome, all right? So for the conversation today, we are gonna focus on how we use the co-creation process, the firms we, we partner with, and the design of the, fi of, of the final partnership, okay? So <clears throat> while we have worked to streamline the overall process, we have intentionally structured the early concept stage and the following stages to make sure we are not just funding an applicant with a compelling idea, but rather an applicant with a sound concept with a viable inclusive business model where USA's investment brings clear additionality in terms of the applicant's ability to test and or scale product, service, or operating model to make sure that the impact extends beyond our collaboration. For, for example, um, and this is really key, once we've done our initial screening for basic eligibility, our team, which involves both sector and business advisors, review the concept with an eye towards understanding the business model behind the concept. And before we go through our final shortlisting um, of, our, of applicants, our business advisors and our sector experts um, send our applicants a series of questions tailored to the concept submitted to help drill down into their business model. We'll raise concerns about the, pro the viability of the, the, the product or the service or the business model itself. Uh, sometimes we might ask some questions to see if there's a, maybe a gap in some of the, um, you know, what we see as a gap in the, the potential um, long-term success of the firm, with, uh, sorry, of the model um, without the support of, of continuing support of USAID. Um, and, and, and at sometimes we'll even um, advise an applicant that we can't fund the concept as presented, but would be open to receiving a revised version where we actually say, we, we, we have a great idea here. We really can't fund this as is. Here's some comments. If you want to reapply, please do so. All right. This process can involve multiple rounds of, of multiple rounds of question and answering uh, and answers before the team decides to proceed. But this is really important for us to make sure that we are making um, the right types of investments. And while a $3 million APS fund does um, seem fairly large, um, in, in, in a, context like Mass a context like Ethiopia, there are tons of opportunities and many different partners that we could work with, okay? And once a concept is shortlisted, um, our team will then start a collab our collaborative 
co-creation process, and this will go beyond negotiating the budget or milestones, uh, which, are, which are critical, but we then really focus on working with the, the applicant can, to consider new ways to structure both their concept and their request um, for funding. And we'll discuss this shortly with uh, Sahul and Elizabeth. Finally, our team will work with um, applicants to look beyond the prospect of receiving grant support from MS4G and rather and help them think through what other ecosystem partners um, they might be able to engage to scale their business model or concepts. Um, and this can include linkages with other donor programs, final, other financial institutions for financing, um, or, or other businesses with complementary business strategies. And in some cases, we might say, you're not, your concept isn't necessarily appropriate for our APS, but we do have some other services that might be able to support your growth. For example, we have a whole network of business advisory service providers that provide a variety of bespoke services to um, our partners. All right, so I'm gonna pause there to see if there's a few questions. Um, and I think Carly, we, uh, I'm gonna rely on you to kind of let me know some of those questions because just because I'm not able to see the, the chat so far. Yep, no questions so far, but um, friendly reminder to please add any questions you have to the chat and I will be sure to convey them to the panelists. Okay, great. Perfect. All right, so um, we're going to shift gears then um, and get into the conversation that I think you all have been waiting for, um, and um, be a little bit more, a little less, uh, be a bit less process oriented and focusing on some of our experience. Um, and I want to start with a question to uh, Elizabeth. Um, our MS4G's most recent APS had a specific focus on wash and fertilizer. Um, which each involves specific context that influence both the applicant pool and their nature of the concepts. Um, could you go a bit deeper into this and how it informed the co-creation process? Absolutely. Thanks, Brett. Um, that was a great overview of our entire process. Um, so just to start, you know, some of the sector dynamics that we were faced with, I think what can't be sort of ignored at all is that the enterprises that we saw in Ethiopia for both wash and fertilizer are relatively underdeveloped, both, you know, all in quantity in diversity and in their capacity. Um, they've been underinvested in and they've been sort of historically crowded out. Um, and there's really just been little space for the private sector to grow and little interest by investors, therefore. Um, and so we knew this going in, we knew that the private sector was weak and we knew that a focus at the enterprise level was warranted to help these promising enterprises grow um, and to increase their distribution to reach their sustainability and inclusion goals. But we were also just a little bit surprised at just how nascent some of these sectors were in reality. Um, you know, the specifically, you know, in the fertilizer sector until just a few years ago, 100% of the fertilizer was imported um, into the country via a uh, government of Ethiopia peristatal. Um, it was all chemical based sort of, you know, tra traditional sort of NPK style fertilizer. Um, and then in recent years, the GOE has been starting to loosen up a little bit of this control, which has opened the way for innovation. Um, likewise, in the wash sector as well, um, you know, there's mostly been most of the business models have been sort of dependent on donor funding. Um, there's been a lot of funding for household level wash interventions from donors, but there hasn't been as much focus on infrastructure or sort of commercially based activities. Um, and we saw this for both of these through a lot of the applications that we were receiving ended up um, and using some development jargon. A lot of times we felt like maybe they were just repeating language from the APS or kind of telling us what that they thought we wanted to hear. Um, but what was really missing in a lot of the initial applications and on the initial thought process was the how. So, as Brett was mentioning, we had to dig in really deep and ask a lot of questions to get to the heart of their business model. To understand their expansion plans to understand their pricing models and the return on investment and all of those things. Um, <clears throat> I will say that many of the applicants were attuned and, and in line with the idea of inclusion of women and youth, which was really great to see. But also there, the how and the strategy of how to do that was kind of missing initially. And so by requiring this in our, in our concepts, in our APS, we actually gave them more space to think about that and to do that better. Um, 
The other thing that we sort of, one of the other factors that we really noticed is a lot of the applicants had some really great innovative um, and interesting ideas, but they really struggled to convert those ideas into well-structured activities that could be funded. Some of these ideas were just too ambitious in their growth plans and trajectories. They weren't really thinking through the practical implications or the steps required. Um, some of them ignored our timeframes. <laughs> you know, they were providing three year plans without any clear set of like phasing of their plans of how they wanted to grow. Um, and some of them even were requesting things like vehicles or construction, which, as we all know, are not necessarily are not really allowed under USAID funding. So we had to sort of, you know, pivot them in that direction. Um, I will say that so many of these applications and what we found, um, they were they were written and conceived of by very technically skilled people. They had great ideas. They just didn't know how to articulate them in a way that was sort of business oriented. Um, and, and to more to that point, you know, a lot of the applications, they just weren't really polished. They were often written in kind of poor quality. The logic was sometimes lacking. Um, and they didn't always follow all the instructions provided. So we had a real task of trying to find the sort of diamonds in the rough and try to like dig through like what was really there. Um, and that multi step process of that co creation using both written questions and verbal feedback and conversations, um, as well as site visits really allowed us to check our assumptions. Like, is it really a diamond in the rough or is it not? You know, and we found that there were some really good concepts, but they just weren't always apparent upon their first submission. Um, the other thing that sort of one of our factors that we really noted was that in sort of casting this wide net, we were able to confirm our sort of operational hypothesis in terms of where the gaps and opportunities are for business expansion for the private sector for both wash and fertilizer. Um, you know, for fertilizer, we, we believed and we'd seen through some of our sort of rapid assessments on the ground that there were opportunities in the non chemical market segment. Um, and really largely been ignored by the government of Ethiopia and that was confirmed. And on the wash side, we also believe the gap was sort of in the infrastructure space and sort of the providing of services. And that was also confirmed um, through this process, just through the applications that we received, we were able to sort of confirm some of our, um, the way that we were thinking about or the way that we uh, believe the, the sort of context to be um, in the country. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, that, that sort of sums up, um, my, my comments on those factors that that really influenced our co creation. So, Brett, back to you. Yeah, I just want to reinforce that that um, element that Elizabeth mentioned in terms of um, having an open mind. Um, I think 1 of the, the lessons learned that we've had um, is, you know, in, in, in the USAID world and in the development world, there's a number of partners that have become very, um, very good at applying um, and responding to USAID. Um, you know, you know, or implementing partner uh, requests for applications, right? Um, and as we are focusing on, you know, on on, on the, the principle of localization, um, it is really important to make sure that we are uh, moving beyond uh, what I'd consider I'd call the usual suspects um, of organizations and enterprises that seem to perennially receive um, funding from different partners um, at, you know. Throughout the, the course of their activity, um, and so um, again, this is this is something that we've really focused on, both in terms of the APS that we had, as well as the open innovation competition, is to take the time to say, okay, maybe the response wasn't as polished as as, a, as um, some of us in the implementing um, partner world might have in terms of responding to a to a grant call, but let's dig into that a bit further. And again, this is where we've used that verbal. Um, but a combination of both the written, the verbal response as in, in verbal engagement, um, as well as um, site visits to kind of make sure that we are, um, that, you know, that we are, um, you know, focusing on those activities that we're having a more diverse and inclusive group of growth uh, group of um, partners and grantees, right? And and making sure that we're helping you know, them grow and meet them where they are um, based on, 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 on their level of um, engaging with USAID um, and implementing partners in the past. Okay. Are there any questions or comments on this topic here before we move on? Yeah, Brett, we have a couple of questions. Um, okay. The first one is, um, I'm just going to read the entire thing. 
so bear with me. If you look closely at smallholder production in most low-income countries, including Ethiopia, food security is limited by dietary calories. Thus, the most critical need is providing access to contract mechanization. This can only be provided by private sector owner operators. How would you facilitate getting contract mechanization available to smallholder communities that will expedite the eight weeks of basic crop establishment and enhance food security? So that's one question. And then um, the second question is, does the award process ever explicitly include upstream or downstream enterprises in the structure? It seems like these enterprises <laughs> be sources of credit or technical assistance and are more important from a sustainability perspective than other donors. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the answer, I think the first question I might hold on because that might be something that takes a bit long. That's a longer answer that um, I'm not a technical, uh, I, I don't think we're not necessarily uh, agricultural mechanization experts here. What I will say is that we did under eight, under ECO, on the MS4G, we do have um, a separate window for food security in which we have, um, we have considered mechanization activities um, that, you know, uh, we have considered mechanization applicants in the past that have, that have focused on that. Um, I think there's both, and, and there it is combination of, um, you know, it could be a grant, but also what we have been testing, and both in catalog and MS4G and some other programs that, that I that I lead, um, is, is how can we use pay for results mechanisms to help incentivize and drive technology adopt, adoption and, and, tech, and, and um, technology diffusion. Might be a, a, a different um, concept. A uh, longer conversation, but it is a, is a very good one. Um, on the question around upstream and, and downstream processes, the example, the, the answer is yes. And we, we look at that. Um, I think Sahul will get into that a bit later in the WASH sector, um, where, you know, we, again, we're not looking just at that applicant and their concept, but we are looking at what are some of the elements that they need to have beyond the funding that they may receive from um, MS4G or another program. Um, for them to grow, and that does involve us looking for ways to engage, connect them to um, financial, you know, access to credit. <clears throat> Again, we do have multiple technical assistance um, windows that are that are delivered on a pay for results basis, um, where service providers, you know, are are compensated for helping enterprises achieve um, specific outcomes, um, and we will we can direct them to that. Um, we, you know, we have activity focused on digital transformation. And so, depending on the nature of the grant of the applicant and the partner, we may fund them um, based on their concept, but also direct them or connect them to other services that we have within the MS4G platform, as well as, 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 well as other enterprises. So, for example, in, in Ethiopia, there is an entire program focused on um, agriculture transformation, right? And so, we are more of a capital, you know, so, you know, depending on the nature of the ask, and that could include the mechanization piece, we may connect them to that other USAID program. Because I do know there's, I think there's a there's alliance in Ethiopia focused on mechanization. Um, our colleagues at, at RTI have a program on agricultural transformation that are very much focused on um, some of the more, um, I guess, um, you know, nitty gritty of of facilitating agricultural growth in specific sectors, right? Because we're very much sector agnostic. So I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that, Sahul. Quickly jumping in, um, Scott, the person who asked the question said that uh, <laughs> they're speaking more to business partners and um, not as much assistance sources. Um, so I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit. I, I think, uh, Brett, you've, you've highlighted uh, all of the things that need to be said from MS4G's uh, activities uh, related to mechanization. So we do have other USAID projects that are working on food systems and agricultural transformation, transformation work that are highly active on not only mechanization, but other related activities um, where we need, where we feel the need to be able to partner and collaborate, we plug in to be able to work it out with them in terms of uh, utilizing our uh, market systems approach in terms of finding access to finance and where uh, farmers or processors need to be able to have specific level of technical support and areas. And then we also um, 
be able to step in and be able to provide the advisory services role that we have. Mm -hmm. So we don't directly have these mechanization of source from private business partners, but we do a lot of collaboration across other mm -hmm. implementing partners in the country to be able to support the needs of uh, the community in Ethiopia. Let me just jump in on one quick point on the upstream and downstream question. And I think once we get into the next section, um, you're going to hear me talk a little bit about um, the distributors and the in input collectors, the raw material collectors for fertilizer and compost. And so that was definitely a big part um, of our thinking um, of us helping them think through their business models. Um, to be able to structure those partnerships, to find those partnerships, to develop those relationships. And that's a huge part of their success. It's not just yeah. a transactional, here's some money, go do this thing. It's like, we really had to like work with them on developing and, and understanding the importance of those relationships. Yeah. So we'll get into that yeah. a little bit more in a moment. Yeah, and I also see that there's a question on, do we leverage, are the grants being used to leverage loans? And we'll get into that uh, with the WASH sector. And also Scott, I just saw your follow up and I, I do, when we do say some of those connections, we are active. We also do look at thinking through other business linkages um, and it really varies on the, the specific activity. And sometimes it can be a financing relationship. It can be a distribution relationship. In some cases, it can be a manufacturing relationship, um, depending on the nature of the activity. So that is part of the entire thinking through the business process. And what are the, the broad, what's the broader ecosystem um, that we need that 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 enterprise needs to engage to be successful. Okay, I'm going to move on because it is interesting because some of these comments, the questions that are coming up are we're, we're, we're actually going to be touching upon later. Um, so, um, you know, I'd like to, so Elizabeth, I want to go back to you um, and I'd like to go a bit, a bit deeper into your experience in co-creating, well, the MS4G experience and co-creating partnerships and business approaches in the, in the fertilizer sector. Um, and I'd like to hear a, a bit more about the concepts and the, the quest for support that we received, the challenges that we found within those concepts and business models, um, and, and how we use the business, the co-creation process to kind of shape those business models um, and result in a portfolio of, of grants that, that, we, that we're fairly confident are going to have a transformational impact on the, the fertilizer sector, particularly on the non-chemical fertilizer sector. Great. Hey. Sounds good. Um, absolutely. So, you know, if you if you advance to the next slide, um, I've got the the goal of our of the APS in terms of fertilizer is listed there. And um, even though within the APS, we we did not actually specify that it was only for non chemical fertilizer producers. We actually kept it open for both. Um, however, it turned out that all the applications were really focused on expanding the op operations of non chemical fertilizer producers. Um, we actually also had a really good range from all of the applicants of different types of fertilizer products. It, it included various types of compost, liquid fertilizers, biofertilizers, which are essentially um, using bacterial inoculants to help break down the soil and the, the, the waste products to, to speed up the the making of those fertilizers compost. Um, there was one grantee who we had a compost facilitator who they were actually selling the product to sell to compost producers to make better compost. Um, one was for bio slurry, which is made out of cow manure. Um, and that was a really interesting one as well. And even using flies, black soldier flies is one other mechanism. So we had a whole range of different types of processes and types of fertilizer that they were going to be making, um, which is what we wanted to see. That was very exciting. Um, and um, we also had, it should be noted, we had a really good geographic spread across the country, which is also something that USA was interested in. So we were happy to see that we were, we were reaching areas far beyond sort of the Addis area. Um, there were basically, after we had submitted this, there were a number of themes that really came out across all of the applications. Um, the first of which is that all of them, as they all had to do with non chemical fertilizer, they all really had to do something with raw material collection and product distribution. So, to ramp up the production of whatever you know, level they were doing at that time, they really needed to source more raw materials for the type of product that they were making. And this really required us to help them think through partnerships and strategies for sourcing. 
Um, while some of the applicants actually had their own source, for example, the, the one that I mentioned for BioSlurry, it was a dairy farm. So they had, you know, 200 head of cattle, they had a source for their BioSlurry, but many of them, many of the applicants still needed to find increased quantities of raw material. Um, to make into the compost or to make into the liquid fertilizer, whatever product they were making. Um, and likewise, distribution of the finished product was a main concern. Um, they really needed to be thinking about partnerships with distributors. For example, you know, one of our, one of the early engagements with one grantee, they asked us for a vehicle to help them to physically move their product. And, you know, we had to say no, obviously, because we can't fund vehicles, but also they didn't quite realize that a vehicle is just such a limited way to get their product to customers. So we prompted them to think more about how to develop those relationships with a network of distributors to get them to sell your products. You know, one vehicle can only take so much at a time, but a relationship with 20 distributors, you're going to sell a lot more product. Um, and it should be noted that in this space of like raw material collection and product distribution is really where we saw the area for job creation and for um, types of jobs that are often filled by women and youth. Um, so that was also sort of another layer of that conversation and trying to help them understand that. Um, a second sort of common theme we saw was that all of these needed serious awareness raising and training on just the use and the impact of this product. Um, these are all relatively new or unknown products so agricultural authorities and influencers really needed to be trained and made aware of this potential. Um, so every grantee we'd built in some level of demonstrations or training or awareness raising to ensure that their product was well known and trusted. Um, in addition to sort of direct person to person training and awareness raising that the that the grantee themselves conducted. Um, so we were only a facilitator. We included radio programming and sort of working with the local extension community as well. Um, so really to help them think through that target market and trying to make sure that the people that needed to know about their product were able to find out that information. And finally, um, another third, the, a third theme that we saw that really came out strong was sort of equipment and modernization. And so many of these applicants are working already at such a small scale that they're almost like a cottage industry. Um, to get them to scale to a commercial level, they really needed to incorporate both modern equipment and businesses, which for depending on the size of your company can be prohibitively expensive. Um, not to mention various challenges with like getting the right equipment or getting good, you know, well-made equipment, things like that. Um, so several grantees did ask for equipment. Um, we did not approve all of these requests, um, but we did approve some, like where it really made sense in terms of their business model and their growth plan. Um, especially for those that were really at more of a commercial, a pre-commercial stage um, that they were sort of really needed that mechanization process um, that was like currently being done manually um, or like in an inefficient manner or was really constraining their, their um, potential to, to grow. Um, and we also noted through some of this that some of these pre-commercial levels were maybe a better fit for like another solicitation mechanism, like our open innovation competition um, which was kind of geared more towards startups and more emerging firms. So there was some of that sort of thinking about where does the, where is, where does the right fit or how is the best way to sort of provide support to these firms? So, you know, the way that we really influenced, you know, our team was able to, through this process, really influence this business model. We really helped them to understand their own business model. And I know that sounds like super basic, but the initial concepts that we received, they did not suggest that they had a good handle on what their business model was and what they needed the funding for. They would often articulate their business model with a statement about like the project goal, for example, you know, to mitigate the acute shortage of chemical fertilizer. And we had to sit back and be like, really, your goal is focused on the practical nature of improving your business operations, you know, so their goal should have been to increase production and sales of X products by, you know, Y kilograms per month or whatever. Um, so the sort of thinking that we were seeing kind of meant that they weren't really thinking about the production and sales goals and how many people or customers they might need to reach. Um, so we had to sort of guide them down this path of thinking differently to articulate their business model. They really needed to be guided through this process and like really think about that how and that strategy. Um, so our team was effectively able to guide them through these conversations and ask questions. Um, you know, there were several applicants that we had to drop that we 
could that, you know, they just couldn't really end up grasping their own business model. Um, one, you know, we would have conversations with them and they would seem like they understood what we were suggesting, but then they would come back with a revised concept and it would still have, you know, many gaps in it or and new gaps in it. So, one, we actually, you know, shifted them and provided them sort of guided them to work with 1 of our BASPs, our business advisory service providers. Um, and, and so that was just another way that we could sort of see, you know, where they were at and what they needed. Um, and then, um. I think the other piece is like, we really help them think through their commercial orientation. You know, I noted earlier that there's such an underdeveloped sense of commercial business practices. You know, several of our grantees suggested, you know, one off activities, for example, you know, an exhibition that would help boost sales like 1 time at that event. They weren't necessarily thinking about sustaining sales over a longer period of time. They weren't really thinking about those relationships that would help sustain those sales. And, you know, our team reflected that this was just very symptomatic of sort of the underdeveloped private sector in Ethiopia. Um, you know, some of the grantees asked for huge budgets to finance business inputs, travel abroad and fund like full salaries of existing staff. So it was really clear they didn't understand techniques to sort of expand customers and partnership networks, as I noted before. Um, you know, and given those challenges, I think it's no surprise that they didn't quite understand how to articulate specific activities and resources and how those would lead to results. So they really, we really had to push them to think through sort of the causal pathways, the causal like relationships, like how do you kind of get from point A to point B to point C to your end result that you want to see. Um, so our, our team really helped guide them with that. They, you know, for example, they didn't really automatically think to include product demonstrations. So our team helped to, you know, kind of help them understand that farmers really need to see the proof that that product will work, that will have, you know, on their soil health, that will have on their productivity and their yields. And so that, that demonstration, you know, was definitely something that they came around to understand much better afterwards. Um, you know, the other piece is sort of, I had mentioned that most of these companies have been started um, or they're run by people with, you know, different backgrounds. For example, a lot of academic people, they're highly intelligent, highly skilled people, but they just haven't been raised or socialized in an environment where, you know, business practices and processes are kind of just part of normal thought processes, right? There's just not socialized in that way. Um, so our team really helped, you know, apply and add that practical level planning skill on top of their, you know, very highly advanced technical skills. Um, you know, after we went through co-creation with all of these folks, they did, most of them seem to understand that there's a lot of value in developing relationships and partners, especially when it comes to those collection and distribution activities. Um, they also seemed to gain a greater sense of sort of the how of how to meaningfully include women and youth. Um, our team helped them think through that strategy, you know, how to reach those groups, how to reach, how to advertise for them, uh, how to ensure that the work that they would be doing is actually really impactful for those populations. So that was another element that we really needed to make sure that it wasn't just, you know, a tick box of like, how many women are you going to reach? It's like, no, how are you really going to structure this so that this is impactful? Um, and, and, you know, finally, I think. I think, you know, the TA had to continue past award. That's another thing. You know, this is behavior change. This is, you know, they need repeated messaging and, you know, these relationships that were built during the co-creation had really led to strong working relationship and implementation. So even when we see mistakes that are happening during implementation, they're able to kind of, we're able to kind of work with them and turn those around and, and sort of address them quickly because of those relationships that were formed during co-creation. So I think that's another element that's really important um, to recognize that those relationships um, are, are developed and the, the, they're very strong and are able to withstand, you know, things later. So I will end there and turn it back to Brett. Um, and uh, I think we're going to hear a little bit more about the watch sector next. So go ahead. Great. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, now, so cool. Um, let's, I'd like to, to dig into some of these, some of our wash examples um, and, and MS4G received multiple concepts um, focused on um, expanding the availability of affordable, safe and clean drinking water at the household level um, in both rural and peri-rural areas. Um, and we're just going to kind of focus on two concepts uh, where uh, MS4G started out with an ask. 
um, for, U for, for USA funds to be used to cover the cost of infrastructure development, um, the in installation or rehabilitation of, of, water, of water systems. Um, as, as, as some of you may know, the USA um, ADS 303 um, does not allow GUC funds to be used to directly finance new or rehabilitated um, infrastructure. There are other means in which um, USA can fund infrastructure, um, but you know, within a contract, a, a, a grant under contract, um, you're not able to do that. Um, so we had to be a bit creative. Um, and so I wanted, um, could you provide us with some, some high level details um, of the concepts in question? Um, and some of the questions that you know, were raised, that were raised within the business models, um, and how the co-creation process kind of worked, um, so that um, we could find a way to get the, you know, to, for for that for these partners to actually build out some of this this um, affordable, reliable water access without the project um, financing the actual infrastructure of that of that work. Sure. Uh, thank you, Brett. Um, so I'll just give uh, maybe two examples that we worked on. They're sort of similar in the sense of what they were asking in terms of financing through our uh, funding mechanism, but different sort of models. Um, for the one of the firms is uh, they were they had piloted a uh, delivery of piped water at household levels. Um, this is generally uh, provided by local municipalities or the government that typically does this and no private sector in Ethiopia has ever attempted to do so or nor did they have uh, permission to do so. So it's a policy issue, right? Um, this private company figured out a way where they are able to engage through a partnership with the local municipality, water uh, municipality, to be able to take a management agreement for a period of four or five years in which uh, they would come in, invest in the infrastructure to be able to uh, rehab rehabilitate and make it functional. And then they would connect uh, multiple households to uh, direct access to potable drinking water, and they would get revenue from um, the usage fees that they have, right? Um, when we received the concept, um, we were Obviously, very thrilled and excited because such thing never happened in, in the country. Immediately, we went to do our due diligence to make sure that they were actually doing what they said they were doing on the concept before we went into a, a higher level co creation session. Once we verified that, um, we asked specific questions on how they intend to do what they need to do. So, some of the issues that were outlined within the concept notice number one. They're doing it in a very small scale level, basically addressing the needs of 200 or 300 households uh, per project. And they were directly investing upfront into in the infrastructure. And that is cost, uh, highly cost uh, prohibitive, meaning a lot of the piped water and construction aspect of the investment is too much for them to be able to handle. So their model really did not make sense for us from a sustainability perspective. Uh, number one, it was high cost upfront. Number two, the impact that they're going to have is very limited in terms of the number of individuals that they're going to impact. And then number three, it took them a very, very long time for them to be able to get a return on their investment. So um, based on discussions, we were able to co-create or develop um, a methodology or a model where it made sense across the board. Number one, uh, we uh, initiated a, a discussion around where they're able to scale up significantly. Instead of targeting 200 households, how do you target 5,000 households? Number two, how are you able to be able to reduce your upfront costs so that you're able to invest uh, or do more work in more communities rather than a single one and be able to afford it? And then number three, how are you able to be sustainable and be able to recoup your investment way, way faster than, than you would? Um, Initially, they thought it was impossible, uh, but it was very possible and we helped them craft uh, a design this business model in a way that um, number one, uh, to be able to have a um, identification of specific uh, water systems and to be able to do studies where MS4G uh, will finance. Number two, 
uh, because of the pre-identification of these uh, water systems, they have a faster time in being able to work where they needed to work. And the upfront cost of these infrastructure developments, which we are unable to finance, uh, we link them with uh, different financial uh, institutions that we are partners with. Um, and not only made the introduction, but proved to the bank um, that this company and others like it have significant number of demand. And that demand is proven by a sort of a pledge or a commitment from thousands of households within the community that they have, their willingness to pay for the service, right? Um, so the, the business model at the end where uh, we uh, agreed on is um, the upfront payment of the infrastructure would be provided by the financial institution, MS4G and uh, the company would be able to co to co-invest in sort of the cost acquisition of customers, which is the survey of how many uh, individuals will, are willing to pay for the service. Number two, uh, the, the actual cost of the investment is going to take. And then number three, who's going to be liable for the, um, for the loan or the for the financing. Uh, so based on this model, uh, the banks uh, had agreed to be able to have a big demand of uh, the requirements that, that they needed to make a justifiable means to be able to financing um, the, the project. Our uh, obligation and our support here was to, for them, for us to be able to figure out how they would put the business model um, uh, together, how for them to be able to recoup their investment faster. So in the past they had 100% of the cost paid up front, but now they're only paying a partial, maybe 20% of that cost and the rest is going to be financed to the bank system. And as households are being connected directly uh, to the system, they would be paying number one, 20% uh, uh, of the cost, which is very marginal for each household that was costing $200 roughly for the, the full payment. So they were only obligated to pay $50. And then the rest of the $150 will be paid over a three or four year period. So this gave confidence to the banks that these are affordable payments that they will be able to make. The company was guaranteeing the loan so that the bank had somebody on the hook to be able to pay it. And then the return on investment for the company instead of waiting four or five years and then with inflation and other cost of reduction and value, they were able to, to be able to recoup that investment uh, much faster. Um, so again, the, the original model was not feasible because of uh, high infrastructure investment cost, long time for them to be able to return their investment. Uh, and then three, um, the amount of uh, time it took for them to be able to, to identify. Um, because of our co-creation sessions, um, we uh, were able to support uh, the partial payments of the households to, to the, the acquisition cost of the firms. Uh, this gave them some little bit of leverage for the firm to be able to start investing into, uh, into the water systems. And now with this structure in place, the company had the capacity to provide up to 30,000 households with access to direct water. This project is uh, ongoing, meaning uh, we are on the first phase of the project and we are uh, providing high level technical support to make sure they're doing what they need to do and be able to support them in a meaningful, in a meaningful way. Um, so uh, I think a lot of this issue uh, upfront where business model was not working because of the, it was not profitable or it was not scalable uh, in the past, but because we had linked them with other market actors, including financial institutions, be able to understand that this is a feasible business. So banks are able to finance in a sector where they're not used to. And then they had a guarantor in between, which is the firm that is able to collect the payments and pay on behalf of these households. So that proved to be um, a viable model, which we had agreed to. And now households are happy. The firm is happy. We are happy. And the financial institutions 
they will be happy. They're not happy yet, right? But they have made commitments and we're working uh, towards that. Um, so in, in a similar manner, the, the quickly, the, the second example I could cite is a, um, a company that has uh, provided a concept for us to be able to finance them uh, in the infrastructure development of uh, digging and constructing water wells in three different regions and being able to use uh, solar water pumps to provide access um, within communities, not at household level, and for to be able to sell it to the community at affordable manner. So immediately that concept was a no-go because we are not able to finance that. And again, it's, it's the high cost of infrastructure that they keep focusing on. They're not able to see beyond what is possible. Uh, so instead, uh, we were able to uh, convince them and work with them to be able to get them to commit to, instead of having to um, construct or uh, dig new water wells, to work with existing water wells that, that, have, that have been dug by uh, either the government or other uh, NGOs or donors that are not functional or that are not 100% uh, workable. Right, so they would be able to to come in, identify those, be able to use uh, solar uh, based or solar powered water pumps to be able to pump up the water because many of these locations are in areas where there's no access to electricity. So being able to use these solar based water pumps made sense and being able to provide access to water to the communities and a uh, using a smart uh, water taps. So what this means is uh, the average cost of water uh, in Ethiopia would have been, for instance, if it was a dollar, this company was willing to provide it to the community at 25% of the cost. So there's a water, there's a cost saving aspect to it. Uh, they're going to have access to water that's purified to be able to uh, get them the access they need to be able to uh, use for their households, for a community of schools, uh, healthcare, or other clinics that they have. Um, and because of that, uh, now we have agreed to be able for the company to be able to use or take advantage of existing uh, water systems that, that take place, build a water tanker or uh, that could store a lot of uh, water within the community, purify it and be able to sell it. So the, one of the innovative ideas in this instance was the, the idea to be able to use these sm smart water taps, which is like a prepaid card that you go and you insert, you take uh, the specific amount of water, one liter, 10 liter, 20 liters that you need to be able to take. Once you remove the card, the water stops. So as an initial to encourage uh, usage of this uh, innovation, uh, we were able to uh, co-finance that as a encouragement, as an incentive for the users. And then beyond that, they're going to be able to use it uh, and uh, be able to top up these cars to be able to come in, which reduces number one, um, wastage of water. Uh, sorry, the uh, number two for them to be able to identify if there are any issues with that with the water points. But I think I'll quickly stop there and 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 uh, get back to you, uh, Brett. Great, thanks. Um... No, I think from my side, again, as, as Sahul had mentioned, um, we are, um, Sahul, did the power go out in the office or is everything good? That was the power, it's back one though. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I think from my side, I'm, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing the outcome of some of these, uh, some of these wash activities, because it is a new, you know, it, it did take a lot of time working with, uh, with, with, our, with our partners to kind of think through the best way um, of collaborating, giving the, um, kind of the restrictions that we had in terms of the types of investments we can have. Um, are there currently, can, is there are a few questions here. I am looking at the chat here. Um, and, um, you know, and I know some of these questions are quite specific. We might not be able to answer. Um, we can try so, but I just wanted to, Carl, if you can um, maybe suck a few for us to give a shot. Yeah, we have um, we have two more questions, and um, like you said, we may not be able to answer them, but I will ask them, and we can see what we can do. Um, so John said, you mentioned that the entrepreneurs have been raised in an environment where business practices are not part of normal thought process. 
Was this a function of the project and its selection process? Are there successful entrepreneurs who have strong business practices who did not elect to participate? Um, so I think that's uh, for Elizabeth. And then, um, and then we had another question saying, um, this is addressed to Sahul, would it be possible to share the business model, including the cost share structure? Can, I can start by answering that first question. Um, you know, that was, I said that point because that was a direct sort of observation from some of our Ethiopian colleagues about sort of their own culture. And I think it's really segmented, right? There's some very highly, you know, there are, there is that culture of entrepreneurship in some segments and some sectors of the economy in Ethiopia, but in this area in, in fertilizer, because of sort of the historical trajectory and the historical um, the people that are kind of engaged in those types of activities haven't necessarily been like socially socialized to kind of think in that way. And so there weren't necessarily a, a, a bunch of highly skilled entrepreneurs in that space. Um, as I mentioned, the contextual factors that we were really faced with were um, this is a very nascent area, you know, that the, the, and we and we knew that that we would have be working with sort of lower level entrepreneurship. Um, skills. And so I think that's really important is that it's not that others didn't choose to participate, but it's that this is what there is. And so we, we, we kind of took that and, and, you know, did the best we could with what, um, what was there and try to help move them down, you know, move them up in terms of their skills and move them up in terms of their thought processes and how they kind of are conceptualizing these business plans. Um, so I guess, Brett, anything else to add or? Yeah, or I was going to say, I mean, some of these observations aren't necessarily unique to just Ethiopia. I mean, I think mm -hmm. um, throughout the world, as we look at kind of innovative solutions that are based in uh, kind of technical solutions or, um, you know, or scientific solutions, you might have um, this, this brilliant, um, you know, this brilliant academic or someone with a really great idea that, you know, that the, um, you know, their kind of skills are really focusing on like the design of that activity and, 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 and the science behind it. Right. And they might not necessarily, um, or the research behind it, it might, they might not, not necessarily have been exposed to how does one go about then scaling this from a business perspective. Um, and so I just, I just, I do want to just, you know, say that it's, it's not just an Ethiopian context. Uh, it is something that we do see um as we have technicians or or academics that have a great idea and then want to bring it to the market right um and and ethiopia, ethiopia does have accelerators and incubators that, that do help in that process and we do have other programs um that 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 focus focus on that but that is where i think the role that we can play in terms of helping that um you know that that scientist that's really dug into that type of fertilizer solution can then actually bring it to market Well, the question on business model, business model so cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to figure out which business model they were referring to, so maybe we can your address first, your first example. I think. Well, I don't know either, but I I would say that those are probably somewhat proprietary at this point, without kind of our the partners first example. giving us yeah, without without our partners giving us approval to share them more widely. Um, yeah, I think if, if, uh, we are able to, to speak with our partner and, and be able to I'll, at least give you more details in terms of what the business model is currently, how we've uh, managed to, to agree on those, then we would mm -hmm. be able to share that with you. Uh, if you can drop your contact, uh, details, then we will reach out to you directly. Right. And then th there was one other question on an economic impact. I don't want to take too much time, but uh, one of the towns while we're doing our due diligence on uh, providing access to water is because now they have access directly access to water to their households, they were able to engage in new economic activities within the community, being able to provide services for uh, washing clothes of others to be able to do those those sort of things to be able to to open up different stores that that provide sales of spare parts for uh, pipings, latrines, and, and other sort of uh, uh, products and services. I think that has enabled the community to be able to engage in new activities, whereas without the availability of water would not have been there. I mean, there are probably uh, a lot more other examples, but I'll leave it at that and 
Uh, if you have no other further questions, Scott, okay. All right. Um, there was a question on the size of the grant. Um, you know, we, again, one thing is that we specifically um, kept this, kept the APS open. Um, I think we ended up um, financing awards anywhere between 150,000 to 700,000. Um, depending on the, the activity again, the, and that budget um, was developed through the co-creation process. And while we do ask for a notional budget um, in the concept stage, um, we really reserve um, kind of that discussion to later on in the process um, as we're, as we've um, clarified kind of the, the, mo the operating model of the, of the ward. Um, and then what makes sense from the, from um, the MS4G investment. Um, and how the milestones would be structured. And, and in a lot of cases did have kind of a pay for results element within, within the awards. Okay. Are there any other, any other questions or comments? I know we've got about four minutes late. Um, I, I do have, um, you know, I, I think we have room for maybe just one very quick question, maybe 30 seconds response each um, in terms of just, you know, if you were, to go back um, six months ago, um, as we've looked at this APS and kind of the process, um, you know, so who will, maybe I'll start with you. Um, you know, what, like, if you were to approach any of these differently or even the process differently, um, you know, how might you adapt our approach? Um, I think um, we, so in both circumstances where I've highlighted in terms of examples, we were able to, to develop the trust and understanding, which allowed us to have a, a very true partnership agreement, right? So of the OSA to, to be able to uh, encourage as many concepts or ideas as possible upfront, I think that's how I would I sort of change it. And through these co-creating sessions, we learned a lot as a project as well. What we thought was reality on the ground was not and then vice versa for uh for our partners or the grantees that had applied so i think to being able to coordinate and be able to speak engage them early on would allow us to be able to design and also better cater to the needs of what is the reality on the ground great Elizabeth? Yeah, on my side, I would just say that I think in the early in the early sort of request for concept notes, I would probably our, our, the way that we structured questions was very open ended. We were like, you know, tell us your idea, tell us this. Tell, I would actually ask for more very specific questions in terms of, you know, what is your current production now? What are you hoping to? What what is your production? You know, perceived at the end? Like, I would I would structure those questions a little bit more closed ended. So that we could really um, quickly look at those concept notes and see, like, what is the what is the trajectory? What is the where are we going? Um, what is the business model? So that you know, you don't we didn't have we wouldn't have to read through pages and pages of the concept note to just even have a sense of what they're what they're going for. So I, I think I would just do it like that more for an efficiency sake than than any other reason. So okay. Great. Yeah. And just as an ad, you know, that is something that that we we did. We did kind of make some of those changes in our in our more recent open innovation competition um, based on some of that learning and and um, have looked to ask some more of those more specific questions so that we don't have to have so much back and forth, um, you know, post concept. Um, are there any? So I think we're going to. Um, and I know there's been a really rigorous chat here, um, and I, we've appreciated that. Um, do want to thank everybody for taking this time out of out of your your busy days. Um, again, we um, interested in hearing from you. If you you know if you want to have any more you know any further questions, um, you know, team can also can share some of this information. A lot of this is a working progress. Just to be clear, a lot of these activities were co-created and. They've been approved by our our um, our USA counterparts, and they're in the in in the middle of implementation now. So my guess is that in in it'll be more it'll be appropriate in six to nine months to kind of have this session again um, to see you know to hold ourselves accountable and actually see if our advice had the intended um, the, the the intended outcome. Um, we are also again catalyzed in many ways is a is a learning um, contract. 
We are eager to hear from our colleagues in the, bro in the broader market links and development community um, to hear what works for you. Um, and I know this is something that um, those of us who also interact with the PSE hub out of Washington and a lot of our projects, you know, there is really an effort to, to think through ways to modernize how um, USAID and its implementing partner community, um, you know, does private sector engagement. Um, and so we are always open to new, new ideas. Uh, we're, we're open to sharing ideas on how to structure RFAs or solicitations. Um, because when it comes down to it, we're all looking to achieve the same impact globally. Um, so I'm going to, to stop there um, in case, and, and in case, unless um, my market links colleagues have any um, anything further to add. No, thank you all for a great session. Thanks for all the attendees for joining. We'll be sharing post event resources on the market links website in the coming days. Great. Thank you all to our amazing Thanks, presenters. Thank you. Have a great day.